Live from San Francisco, California, extracting the signal from the noise, it's theCUBE, covering DockerCon 2015. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media, with special thanks to Docker. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone, live in San Francisco, here at DockerCon 2015, Silicon Angles, the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal of noise. We're halfway through the year, I think we have Jeff, 40 events under our belt. I'm John Furrier, my host Jeff Frick, and we have our next guest, Cube alumni and venture capitalist at Greylock, Jerry Chen, uh, former cloud guy at VMware, investor in Docker, his first investment, looking good off the tee. Welcome back to the Cube. Hey guys, it's great to be back as always. Yeah, we are obviously always talk about you know yeah. your first investment, Docker. Now you got a few more investors under your belt, um, but you were making bets cloud early. Cloud is now crossed over, right? I mean, it's no brainer. Amazon numbers sure. are released now; they've broken out. They say seven billion. We're Dave Vellante, and I expect they it might be more like ten billion, if not more, yep. huge ramp, yep. no race to zero, certainly some commoditization, but value shifting. Oracle's releasing numbers at a Larry Ellison event yesterday. Their business is booming. Yep. So, you know, there's not a race to zero going on. So there is value in those hills. Sure, right? it's, it's like I always say, you always want to ride a wave bigger than you, right? So you're going to fight Oracle in the database market. In your cloud era, you, you ride the big data wave. If you're going to fight um, Oracle's old business or Microsoft or even VMware, you ride the cloud wave. So you look at the SaaS companies like Salesforce.com, Workday, ServiceNow, how do you fight the previous generation? You ride a wave bigger than your opponents, and that's going to be the, the cloud wave. And so I think what you're seeing is the sea change of how IT is done. And when I say how IT is done, I mean how it's purchased, how it's used how applications are built, how it's deployed, and I think Docker, as you see around you, is really at the center of a lot of this transformation. You know, we had John Willis on earlier, whose company was bought by Docker, great guy, yep. super, just rolling on, just great, great plutonium in the in theCUBE. Um, but there's a moment in time now, I think yeah. we're a BC, okay, before uh, cloud. Sure, okay? and, yeah. And he made a great point, he said, Amazon came out, just to say seven years ago, just because a seven year itch is a good, good thing to look at. So seven years of learning, Yeah. okay, now people are figuring it out. Yep. You were one of those folks who was in there looking at yep. investments post VMware. Obviously VMware had visibility at the enterprise. So we're seven years in, people are figuring it out. The cloud is the way. The yep. underlying infrastructure is changing. What is that? Because when the infrastructure has radical changes like this, mm -hmm. there's huge disruption. So I've, I've um, talked about this in the past, it's something I call it a DDI, Developer Defined Infrastructure. So you look at these waves and kind of the 80s and 90s, you had physical defined infrastructure. It was, you were dominated by the big system guys like Sun, DEC, Digital, right? You, we debated CPU architectures. And then you had kind of software defined infrastructure, where you separated the logical from the physical. Operating systems, Red Hat, Microsoft, they all took off. VMware was kind of pinnacle of that software defined world. But what happens is when you define infrastructure and software, you can program it, you make it portable. And that's the beauty of this cloud wave, what I call a DDI is now, to your point is, Every piece of infrastructure from storage to networking to compute has an API, right? And, and AWS was, the, was an early trend where S3, EBS, EC2 had API. And I see, as building blocks as too. As building blocks. It's exactly, the, the Lego Not blocks. Not monolithic. Monolithic building blocks, every little building block had its own API. And just like Docker really is, is the API for this unit of the cloud, enables developers to define how they want to build their applications, how to network them, you know, as, as Will's talked about, and how you want to secure them, how you want to store them. And so, the beauty of this generation is now developers are determining how apps are built, not just at the, you know, end user, you know, iPhone app layer, the data layer, the storage layer, the networking layer. So every single level is being disrupted by this concept of a DDI and where, uh, how you build, use, and actually purchase IT has changed. And you're seeing the incumbent vendors like Oracle, VMware, Microsoft try to react, but you're seeing a whole new generation of startups. So I got to ask you, I love this developer-driven infrastructure. It's basically software-defined, software-led, yep. everything's about software, and but software consistency is yeah. key. Yeah. You know, I'm a big bank and I have I buy drives from XYZ or servers from server server Z over there, or yeah. server Y and XYZ. They have different code bases. They're B BC there before cloud. What's going to be two years? Everyone's rewriting their code. Right? So yeah. there's a there's a there's a dilemma. So the question yeah. is, developers and DevOps assume abstraction from hardware. Yep. So there's a lot of hardware vendors out there. Oracle says, we're going to engineer our hardware for Oracle. Sure. 
That's great for Oracle. Sure. But what about the software community out there now? What's their choice? So I think you're seeing you know, that pendulum of like engineer systems, like Sun, Oracle, full stack versus you know best of breed software elements. I think what you're seeing is this um, this third wave or a third way rather for, in this called developer defined infrastructure. Before you think about it, the, the same architecture, your, your, your x86 plus Windows and Linux ran everything from a web server to uh, your email app, right? The same more or less components. But now all of a sudden, you have what I call metal to the management, metal to the pixel. You, these cloud applications, these cloud vendors are at scale where you can actually build servers, systems, operating systems for purpose-built functions. It could be big data, like Hadoop, right? It could be uh, photo archiving your Facebook. So you look at the web giants, Google, Facebook, they build whole data centers to the dirt, right? Cooling power, yeah. optimized for a single type of application. So what I, what I believe is, the, comp the third way of this new infrastructure is you have best of breed software, mostly open source like Docker, then you can actually engineer your systems for the type of application you want to run. And look at Intel's participation with Cloudera and the Hadoop community. They believe that big data applications um, engineered around their architecture will drive a whole bunch of usage of new server units. So I think you're seeing this third way evolve. I think it's an opportunity. I mean, you see the success of, say, Nirvonics out yep, there. Yep. You're seeing the hardware guys who were young and smart and look at the integrated stuff yeah. saying, hey, you know what? If I align, it's not just about running great on VMware anymore. Sure. It's about running great on everything. Sure. Right? So there's going to be an opportunity for the HPs, for the IBMs, and the Dells, and the pure storages, and the EMCs out there. So yeah. those guys are the one spectrum of the metal, or end-to-end. -end. So on the end-to-end, -end, what's your take on that, that piece? End-to-end -end architecture, software running ah. across... You know, for performance the, reasons. For performance reasons, there are, um, you know, like I say, I think with insert of functions, there there's room for end end. So pure storage is a great example, right? They've architected uh, all flash array with um, proprietary software around how to store and DG your data, and they're just killing it, right? They are taking market share away from the incumbent vendors, and they're probably the best kind of tier one storage solution out there, end to end for storage. With that said, on, on top of pure storage, they support VMware virtualization, they're going to support containers, they support databases, open source, closed source. So they've engineered something in, in their world, end to end, that far exceeds in, in price, performance, any incumbent. But they're still enabling your selection of, of technology above their stack. So this is where Docker kind of comes in, because you just brought up right. a good point. Pure right. is a great example. I mean, they're a storage only vendor, but they have hardware. But their software vision is compatible with what right. the world's moving to with kind of DevOps. And explain that for the folks out there. Like, there's, there's this whole yeah. enablement piece so you can survive in a hardware world, if you will, sure. if there's a good software model. Sure. I think the enablement is the right word, right? So I think the vendors who enable choice from the developer point of view, the, the application architecture, architecture point of view, enable choice will win and thrive. Right, the, the vendors that restrict choicing have to use our system, our hardware, our software. Those guys will probably find some relevance in their installed base, but you know I wouldn't bet on them in the long run. Right, I think that that world um, is slowly receding, and the ability to enable choice at every layer of the stack is kind of where developers are, are going. To. So, are we in one BC or zero BC before cloud? We're, I mean, would you just would you make this year the flashpoint? Last year, or is it not yet here? I would say, you know, I, I like to say 2015 is the beginning of uh, the developer defined infrastructure age, right? That, you know, this year going forward for the next 15, 20 years, kind of the beginning of this new generation, how you think about developers, operations, applications. And everything before this was, hey, we're, we're enabling everything in software, and that's great. Because that whole enablement of software and separating the physical and logical, and, and that flexibility was useful. but. Again, if you're a developer, the true power of software and software-defined infrastructure is program programmability and portability, right? I can now program my hardware like I do like my, my calculator, my computer, yeah. and that's beautiful, right? Because you can all of a sudden um, reduce costs, increase speed, you know, like the yeah. networking stuff we were talking about earlier. Now that your software is programmable and developer-defined, the agility around networking just goes through the roof. So your cohorts at VMware, Steve Herod, Pete Sonsini, yourself, all ex-VMware guys, um, are kind of this new school. 
So what are you investing in? Because you guys are all making pretty good bets right now. Steve's looking good. Pizza Oz got the Cal connection. Yeah, yeah. He's in Databricks and a bunch of other deals he's got going on. You've got Docker. You're at Greylock. All tier one VCs, all kind of sharp, focused on this new generation. Yeah. What is your investment thesis today? Obviously, data-driven infrastructure, we heard that. What are you looking for? You're always out and pounding the pavement. Yeah. Pressing the so flesh. It's uh, Getting it's, deals. What's uh, hot for you right now? <laughs> You make it sound so easy. Um, <laughs> so for sure, in uh, the, the DDI world, there's a bunch of stuff we talked about, I'm thinking about, but likewise in the data layer, right? So uh, Greylock's invested in, in Cloudera, we're investors in Delphix, we're invested in Sumo Logic and Trifacta, so we spend a lot of time in the data space, and we've been super fortunate to be invested in um, you know, generational apps like uh, Workday, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook on the consumer side. And so for sure, I'm looking at two other areas. One, it's another generation of SaaS applications. Like, again, are the, what's the next generation of CRM? You know, what's the next generation of Salesforce? The next generation of um, SAP or, you know, any of those apps out there? Because what's transforming those guys, again, you got to ride a wave bigger than you. The cloud wave is, has come, right? So they're being disruptive. But, you know, data mobility are also transforming how I think about these next generation applications. So I'm spending a lot of time on how data and analytics at that you know data tier will transform your um, enterprise applications. Could be ERP, could be CRM, could be you know anything and above. So you've been a couple of years in as a VC, certainly Greylock's a great firm, um, at VMware you're on the other side of the table, yeah. um, you're in the industry, so you got you know had, had a lot of experience. What's your advice to the entrepreneurs out there? Because you know a lot of noise out there. You know, there's a lot of hype in the blogs, and, and usually people are reading press releases, I should be doing this. There's always that fear of an entrepreneur. Sure. Am I doing the right thing? What should I be betting on? Where's my validation? Because usually heads down. Yeah. Um, in this world of this new order, the new cloud, what's, what's your advice to them in terms of staying the course? Sure. You've seen success and other companies out there succeed and some fail. You've seen a lot of deal flow. What could you advise for entrepreneurs? So the highest level, again, uh, pick a wave bigger than you, bigger than your opponents. Right? So if you pick the Docker wave, container wave, you're going to do well, because this, this is inevitable going to be how applications are built going forward. So pick that, pick a mobile wave, right? So if you're like Facebook or finding Google, you pick the social wave. Your Instagram and photos, trying to find Facebook and photos, you do the mobile first wave. So pick a wave bigger than you, number one. Number two is a trend, not so much a category. Not a category, a trend, right? And you know, you can argue security is a trend now because there's always going to be bad guys at yeah. your front door. So that's an inevitable place to invest in. Number one, so pick a trend that's going to be larger, more powerful than your incumbents, because you know they have a hard time changing the dime. So pick a, a trend, a way that's counter to what the incumbent's going to do. Number two, especially on the enterprise side, I always say this. Um, it doesn't matter if you're the fourth or fifth best thing they've seen all day, they're only going to have budget for one or two things. So how do you make sure that the one thing or uh, the one thing you're selling hits their top you know, to-do list in terms of priorities? Because they don't have time or budget for 20 things in a year, how do they make sure they're going to spend money on whatever you're selling? And the third thing is always, uh, we spend a lot of time on the technology and the product, we don't spend enough time to think about how to get the products into the hands of our customers. So distribution is key, right? And On to a solution map that, that's pinpoint. Well, yeah, how do you reach the buyers? And, and you know, my partner Neil likes to say, and the battle between your um, startup versus your incumbent is the battle between technology and distribution. The startups have better technology, the incumbents you know, like, have better distribution. Install basic customers, a sales force, a channel. So how fast can the startup build distribution, a channel, route to market, partnerships, you know, open source adoption and love, versus how fast can they come and buy or build that technology? And that's the race. And that's that's you know why I have a job. It's like let's bet on great technology, but let's also think about what are the one or two or three things we need to do to enable us to get that product to market, right? Is that direct sales? Is that open source? Is that partnerships, is that OEMs and you know, there's no magic bullet there, yeah. but for the entrepreneur out there, let's be thoughtful about how to sell it as well. But, but there are so many options on distribution, because yep. distribution needs to be such a hard barrier to, to, to breach. It Correct. was such a lock-in. Correct. And, and it's look, no, look no further than Shadow IT and, and Amazon, and um, Atlassian is down the road. They, yep. they had the greatest thing, I think, ever, John. You spend 10 bucks, it goes to 
to uh, schools in Africa and you get 10 seats. I mean, they got into everywhere with that model. The land so expand works. It's, it's really interesting how that distribution barrier is just not, look in publishing. I mean, you had to have somebody printing your papers and a bunch of guys throwing it on the, curbs every day, right? And I think um, there's not one, to your point, Jeff, there's not one um, path to heaven, right? So I call this a unit value. Depending on what you're selling, you got to pick the right channel, the right pricing. So if you're selling something like um, ERP software, you know, or the unit of value sell the whole company, right? Or you're selling big data or uh, like a Jeep distribution, you're selling like large systems, a lot of software for a lot of data. So that, you got large unit of value, price enough, get the right direct sales force. If you're selling something like, um, that's an individual developer, Atlassian, right, Slack, or, or, or consider by Dropbox, where one person can use it, then your unit of distribution, your unit value is smaller, so you can distribute through open source, via the web, yeah. um, through the app store for some of these consumer apps. And then the question becomes, are your economics right? And how do you scale it from, you know, from small to big? Right, and right. It, it's something like a Docker, the unit value can be very small because you get value from a single laptop, a single container. But what you saw today with Project Orca, um, and uh, the uh, trusted registry, you saw how they're taking that small unit value, a single container, putting them together, saying, hey, look at Swarm, look at Pose, look at Orchestry, look at Project Orca. We're going to add value from the small to the big. And um, I just love that because I think they have a, they've, they're unlocking you know, value all along the way from the small developer to the large enterprise. And if you can do that, you're going to build something very And special. they're also eliminating friction. And Correct. the growth. Correct. So it's really a double it, double win. It's a smooth path. And yeah, if you yeah. can un unlock, make that frictionless, unlock that path, then there, there's a lot of value you're going to All right, here's a question for you. So entrepreneurs always, sometimes the ones that are nervous and don't have, have imperfect information, yeah. sometimes zig when they should zag. Mm -hmm. So what's your advice to them and to when not to, sometimes the best move is not to move, stay sure. in the course, trust your gut, We've heard that advice many times from many folks, but a lot of times there's always infighting amongst teams. When should I zig? Yeah. When should I zag? What's your take on, on that? What's your advice when you're on the boards of these companies or just in general, what's your uh, philosophy? You know, I, there is no right answer to zig or zag. When or what? When do you do and when you don't? I mean, sometimes when you zig or you, you pivot like a doc cloud to docker, you, you unlock something that wasn't there before. Sometimes staying the course and being patient, and having a vision. Like Reed Hoffman, when he started LinkedIn, he had a vision of what he wanted to build LinkedIn into, and he didn't. He stayed the course for five, six, seven years. He exactly he could had, smell the opportunity. He knew it. He had that fun little insight of where he wanted to go. Um, you look at folks like the Airbnb folks; they knew exactly what they wanted to do from the very beginning. Pure storage; they knew exactly what they wanted to do. Cloudera; they knew what they wanted to do. So, in some cases. Um, you stay the course despite the, the market dynamics, the competitive dynamics. In some cases, you need to be um, agile and nimble. And so I think the question is not do you zig and zag or do you never or when do you do it, is um, what signals do you need to watch? And I think the great entrepreneurs and the great investors and board members can help by saying, okay, we've seen this story play out. We can pattern match, you know, let's stay the course because we understand what, yeah. what's real here because we're creating real value or we're creating a, a deep competitive moat or saying, you know what, you know, we've, we've seen this before, This we're reading the tea leaves, this doesn't seem right, yeah. we should kind of move over to something else. Sometimes you can connect the dots and see that. Good, good advice. Okay, what are you excited about this show? What's going on here for you? You know, obviously, uh, you're yeah. proud Papa with the investment in Docker. <laughs> the team's amazing. Solomon was on earlier. You yeah, saw that. Solomon's great. You know, and, and he says it's about peace and love. It's not about war and destruction. It's a really happy community. I mean, you know, what's your takeaway? What's your, what are you excited about for here at DockerCon this year? Well, I mean, I, I think the top line is just the growth, and not just the conference, but the the customers, the partners, the users. I mean, you guys see this at every conference, right? I'm sure not just DockerCon, but almost every other conference you go to, people will talk about Docker. Right, and, and, and from the operating system application, number one, the usage and the growth of uh, the technology has really uh, crossed the chasm, leaped the hurdle, whatever you know, metaphor, <laughs> analogy, cliche you want to use, way faster than expected. So number one, the growth out there it just um, uh, makes me excited because I know and I believe when you have that kind of growth, there's opportunity. There's opportunity for Docker, there's opportunity for every one of these other vendors, other companies, 
uh, companies that are here because when you have that kind of growth in, in the, the market, there creates opportunity, right? What about the money making? Because obviously you're an investor, you want to get Absolutely. liquid. Honestly, there's a nice private equity market going on now for public, so maybe you can take a little bit off the table. But in general, Docker has to make some business model decisions. Sure. Not now, down the road, what's your signals that you're looking for for kind of the business models, when to monetize, how to monetize, how to look at the value opportunities? Well, I think what you're seeing here um, this morning, the keynotes, two areas that they're they're looking at monetizing. First and foremost, you see them talk about um, Docker Trusted Registry, right? So Docker Hub, you know, Docker Hub Enterprise, the hosted version, a private cloud version of Docker Trusted Registry, start to monetize kind of that, the core concept of collecting, managing, deploying your, your Docker containers inside and outside the enterprise. So that's, I think, the first step. Um, and then I think what we did uh, what we saw in the keynote is this Project Orca, which is basically putting Docker as a platform, and Docker really is a platform. You look at the runtime itself, the container format itself, Project Swarm, um, or, or the Swarm project for orchestration and deployment. So if you look at Swarm and Docker, um, Compose, all those open source projects collected together, Docker really becomes this cloud platform, and they saw with the Project Orca, they're announcing how they're going to basically, you know, put a bunch of these components together and make it this, um, in, I think, an incredible system, an incredible platform for build, ship, and running your applications. All right, final question, and we're getting, we're getting out of time here. Tell the folks who are watching, um, what's happening at the show? What's the vibe? What's your, what's, what, what are they missing by not being here? Um, so first and foremost, if you're not here, uh, number one is the optimism and energy, right? It, it, it's, it reminds me of just so many great communities have been lucky to be part of, that A, the energy, the interest of every developer, every customer, right? And oh, normally you think customers versus developers, a vendor versus customers, they have this antagonistic, you know, like, hey, why are you charging me? But this conference right now, if you're not here, that um, A, optimism between all the parties involved is is pretty amazing. And so I think, for me, that's the best thing about being part of communities. It's why I'm a venture capitalist, right? It's why I love to be around entrepreneurs, is that, like, um, limitless fountain of a um, brilliant insights, but that optimism with these CEOs yeah. and entrepreneurs it's I deal with. It's a wealth-creating opportunity, innovation here. It's that, it's, you look at Solomon. He's the most optimistic person in the room, in the planet, yeah. because he only sees the potential of where things can go. And just, I just feel lucky to be around guys like that. Jerry Chen from Greylock here inside the Cube, sharing his thoughts, commentary, vision, his investment thesis, and, and advice for entrepreneurs here inside the Cube, live in San Francisco. And we'll be right back with more coverage after this short break.